evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm honored and privileged uh, to be here. I'm not used to wearing this, so I'm not really a pop star, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, so please <laughs> excuse me. So um, thank you very much, Alan, uh, for the introduction. And uh, so what I would like to do is to really um, take you through this new thing of personalized medicine. Um, and I do apologize, first of all, that some slides may be rather technical, and I'll go through them slowly. But those of you who are more experts at this than I am, I apologize that some slides may not be technical enough. <laughs> so, uh, personalized medicine. Let me just take you through what is going on at the moment in terms of the NHS. Alan said that I've been interested in drugs and the study of drugs, drugs that we use in patients. <coughs> and drugs represent the second biggest uh, cost to the NHS, apart from uh, uh, after staffing costs. Uh, at the moment, in the whole NHS, we spend uh, at the moment in the NHS we spend 16 billion pounds per annum uh, on drugs, which is a huge, huge budget. And if the drugs were working perfectly in everybody, that would be worth it. But unfortunately, uh, drugs are costing more and more, and not only working everybody. Uh, so you can see this list of the top 10 most expensive drugs uh, in the NHS. I won't go through each one of them in terms of what they do and what they're used in. Uh, uh, but the top four drugs cost the NHS one billion pounds per annum. And, and this is only likely to increase in terms of costs uh, for the NHS. And the, uh, the cost has been increasing year on year. Um, and part of the problem is that as we move into the future, the cost of developing a drug increases. At the moment, uh, it has been estimated that to take a drug from the first time it's discovered in a test tube to uh, working uh, in patients and being able to be prescribed by a general practitioner or a hospital specialist costs £1 billion. Pounds. And the reason for that is that there's quite a lot of attrition. Only one of the drugs that uh, a pharmaceutical company makes uh, in a test tube, out of 5,000 different drugs it may, uh, compounds it may produce, only one of those will actually make it to market. So there's a huge attrition rate, um, and, and that obviously adds to the cost uh, of uh, failure. Part of the problem is that not every drug works in every patient that we give it to, uh, first of all. So I'm a physician. Uh, I think I practice personalized medicine, so do all of the physicians. But what we do um, is rather crude. Uh, we do it on the basis of population-based studies, randomized controlled trials, which look at thousands of patients in the randomized controlled trial, and that tells us what may be the best drug to use. However, when I have a patient in front of me, in my surgery, um, what I'm trying to do is to extrapolate from the thousands of people in the randomized controlled trial to that individual in front of me. And that is a relatively crude way to be able to treat a patient. So therefore, it's not surprising not all the drugs work uh, in, in every patient that we use the first time. And we need to be able to improve on that. Unfortunately, there's also the issue that some patients develop side effects of drugs. No drug is without risk. Uh, you know, we, we try to prescribe drugs on the basis of benefit, but unfortunately, some drugs also have a risk associated with it. And adverse drug reactions are common, unfortunately, in the NHS. Six and a half percent of all admissions to our hospitals are, are caused by adverse drug reactions. At this very moment in time, if you take all the beds in the NHS, uh, including Scotland, Wales, etc., and England together, 8,000 NHS beds, that's 10, 800 bed hospitals. If you consider that each hospital is about 800 beds, 10, 800 bed hospitals are occupied by patients with side effects to drugs. And we need to be able to overcome that. That costs the NHS one billion pounds per annum. And we need to be able to improve upon that. So these are the issues in terms of prescribing drugs. And the way to be able to solve that, there are many different ways people are trying, but personalized medicine is one of those. And personalized medicine is not the answer to everything, but it is at least a step forward uh, in the right direction. And, and really, if you go to... Um, buy something for yourself, um, as this person tried to do, <laughs> <laughs> to. 
you're not going to buy clothes that are not going to fit you. You're not going to buy clothes that are too big or too small. You want uh, clothes that fit you perfectly. And so we should be expecting the same thing uh, of the drugs that your doctor prescribes to you. You should have drugs that are personalized to you, that make you feel better, that are the right dose for you, that improve your symptoms, cure your disease, and not cause side effects. That will, that's what we should say. Now that's a tall order, and I'll show you why that's a tall order. But nevertheless, that's what we should be aiming for. And, and that's what personalized medicine tries to do. Now, at the moment, we've got some fantastic tools, technologies, knowledge that's been generated in this century that allows us uh, the ability to progress the sort of uh, potential for personalized medicine. Obviously, the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, advance uh, in science has been the uh, sequencing of the Human Genome Project. Now, that was completed, uh, the first draft in 2001, the final draft in 2003. Uh, and, and the important thing is that all that knowledge is now made freely available to anybody in the world who wants to study it. We've gone from the era of actually producing scientific advances and keeping them secret. The internet has been fantastic in terms of allowing us to be able to share that knowledge so lots of people can look at it. And, and the work that's been done since the Human Genome Project was sequenced is that we know that 99.9% uh, .9 of our human genome is exactly the same, almost all of you uh, in, in, this, in this room. However, 0.1% is different. Now, if it's a 0.1% isn't very much, actually, if you consider that the human genome has 3 billion bases, 3 billion codes, 0.1% of that is 3 million. <coughs> So if you consider how many random variations you can make from 3 million, you can see that's why you all of you look different from each other. And that's the reason uh, for, for why uh, so there's this kind of diversity and human population is so important for our survival. But also, unfortunately, it means that some people have predisposition to disease because of this 0.1% difference, but also different people react differently uh, to the drugs we give them because of this 0.1% difference. And this variation in the human genome is present in every population uh, in the world, in this country, in the world, uh, including in Liverpool at Anfield. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, don't believe the internet. <laughs> this is what you call fake news. <laughs> at the same time as the fact that we've got this not advancing knowledge on the human genome project, um, the, the, there's been advances in technologies as well. So the first human genome project took 13 years to complete at a cost, as you can see there, of $3 billion. A huge amount, and 13 years. But now, we can actually get the whole human genome sequenced for less than $1,000. It's taking less than two weeks, and in fact, uh, it's coming down. Uh, I got an email from a company saying, you know, that uh, for my research, if I wanted to sequence some human genomes, they would do it for me for $600. In the next five years, ten years, it would be down to $100 um, to be able to sequence human genome. The problem is when you sequence it, there are three million uh, letters in there. Uh, you need to know how to analyze those three million letters. And, and, and that's where the challenge lies as well. So people say that although the human genome sequence is costing uh, you know, less than $1,000, the analysis is probably taking $100,000 at the moment. However, it's improving all the time. And, and you know, the, the ambition of the 100,000 genome project, which is going on in this country, is to be able to rapidly turn around the whole human genome sequence uh, within, within uh, a week or so, which, which is a fantastic achievement as well. At the same time, what we're doing is producing huge amounts of data. And there's a data revolution going on. And I think that's also a driver for personalized medicine. At the moment, we're producing five exabytes of data every two days. And if you don't know what exabytes are, that's uh, five times 10 to the 18. Five centillion. And that's 500 to 3,000 times the content of the Library of Congress. So we're producing so much data and we need to be able to utilize it. Uh, and obviously, 
Uh, big data is the thing that everybody talks about. Um, I'm not sure what most people know what that means. <laughs> Uh, and, and, but you know, it is it is coming along. There's huge amounts of things going on, and that is something that we need to be able to learn how to use, so that we can actually take into all areas of medicine and, and personalised medicine. Certainly, taking advantage of that. And some of the drivers of personalised medicine are seen on this slide. So the first one is Moore's law, which relates to what I showed you before: that the fact that computational capacity is doubling every two years, uh, and that's continuing, and that's important. Cooper's law said that you know, the amount of data we transmit doubles every 30 months. So you know, that, that's, that's a huge, huge increase as well if you think about it. Um, and also Metcalfe's law about networking and so on. And you know, the networking, the sort of kind of uh, enormous uh, improvements in South, etc. that have been in the internet, etc. Uh, is again a portion of the square of the number of connected users, and you imagine the number of users there are at the moment in, in, the, uh, in the whole globe. And unfortunately, Aaron's law is also about drug cost doubling uh, every nine years or so. You know, and these are all drivers for personalized medicine, and we need to be able to utilize the technologies, the advances that are occurring, really to help us uh, drive forward personalized medicine. So, one of the things that you will also see in the papers and, and certainly within um, medical literature is that different people will use different terminologies. Personalized medicine is one thing. Uh, who's heard of personalized medicine? Okay. And who's ever heard of stratified medicine? Very few. Uh, who's heard of precision medicine? Right. Uh, and, and precision medicine is this term which was introduced recently, more recently, and Obama has probably made it famous. But personalized medicine is what uh, people know uh, or have heard of. Stratified medicine is a very UK-based term. Hardly anybody else anywhere else in the world uses it. But in a way, they're all interchangeable, uh, and there may be subtle differences, but people do use them interchangeably. And what they basically mean is the tailoring of medical treatment to the characteristics of the individual patients. So you can classify people into either small groups or the individual that's sitting in front of me in my surgery so I can give them the right drug at the right time, at the right dose, uh, for the right outcome. And this will hopefully improve um, outcomes. People worry about that, is that if you start treating individuals in front of you, what about the you know, overall population? Are you going to reduce public health? And we know that public health is hugely important you know, the major advances that have happened in terms of improving our lifespan have been related to public health interventions, you know, vaccines, clean water, etc. But, but they're not competitive. Our personalized health and public health are actually complementary, and we need to be able to do both of those uh, and work uh, uh, and, and really take that forward for the human population. So the way I look at um, personalized medicine is that um, at the moment, what we do in medicine is really rely on things that came out in the 19th century, 20th century. We have very gross descriptions of diseases. Um, that is that uh, a disease such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis is just called ulcerative colitis. But in fact, what we are learning as we move into the new era of genomic medicine is that each individual disease is many subtypes of disease. And, and, and we are really starting to invent a new taxonomy of disease. So in the next um, 20 years, I think we're going to have a completely new taxonomy of disease, which says that this is uh, ulcerative colitis subtype A, subtype B, subtype C, subtype D, etc. And that also allows us to be able to then treat individuals for those different subtypes of disease. Unfortunately, well, even though we have some strata of disease when we define those, um, there is still going to be variability on how each of us individually respond to a drug. And this is the area of pharmacogenetics, which is where um, I've been particularly working, and I'll show you some examples of why this is probably at the sort of, um, most advanced state in terms of trying to introduce precision or personalized medicine into, into um, clinical practice. The final aspect, which is the most difficult, is what you do in your life, and so on. Uh, all of you will be different in terms of the amount of exercise you do, 
uh, the amount you drink, the amount you eat, um, uh, uh, and, and other things as well, smoking, etc. And all of that can affect how uh, you react to a drug. Um, and, and so, and that's going to be the most difficult to capture, uh, to be able to in, uh, in, uh, intersect with the genetics, etc., and how we can then integrate all of that to be able to tell us how we treat uh, people better than we do at the moment. So to go from the bottom of this pyramid to the top is going to be a long journey. There's huge opportunities, but there's huge challenges as well. And that's what a lot of work that's going on in this country and worldwide is really trying to tackle. So what I'm going to do is, in order that I can talk to you in theoretical concepts, um, but I thought it might be better if I give you some specific examples of diseases where it's actually working, where things are, and, and, and you can see from that what the challenges are as well. So I'm going to start off with cancer. Um, I know obviously you know, cancer, one in three people in this country will get cancer at some point. Cancer is a genetic disease. Um, we're born with a genome, and we live with that genome for the rest of our life. Unfortunately, cancer uh, is a second genome that develops in some of us. And cancer is a genetic disease. So somebody who has cancer has two genomes, the cancer genome and the genome that they were born with. The cancer genome has lots of mutations in it. Those mutations are things which are driving the cancer forward. And um, in some cases, and I know you may not be able to read all of this on, on the slide, in some cases, uh, people have found that those particular mutations are the drivers for that cancer, and you can develop drugs for that particular mutation, and therefore try to uh, treat that particular cancer. So, um, here's an example. Um, malignant melanoma. Uh, most, most cases of malignant melanoma, if uh, captured early, can be resected, uh, and, and patient is fine. But unfortunately, in some cases, the melanoma uh, does metastasize. It goes up to the uh, bones, to the liver, etc. And on the sort of uh, the first um, uh, sort of PET scan, this is a PET scan, posture emission tromography scan, and uh, what you can see are these red spots, which are all the metastases. And, and uh, investigators uh, in the Sanger Center in the Cambridge were able to sequence uh, a patient's uh, metastases like that, and they found that, that there was a gene called BRAF, and they found there's a mutation in that gene. And that mutation was driving that cancer forward. And so what they did was to work with a drug company, and they were able to develop a drug called Vemurafenib, but the name doesn't matter, which was able to actually interact with that particular mutation in BRAF. And when they gave it to a patient like this, with the two weeks later, the cancer disappeared. You can see in this one, um, the cancer has completely dissolved away, which is fantastic result. And there are many examples of that in different cancers. Unfortunately, cancer is a hugely complex disease, hugely complex biology. And what happens is that you get secondary mutations occurring after you give the drug, and the cancer comes back after six months. So the next challenge in this area is well, how do you give two or three drugs in combination to prevent those mutations from occurring, and you give long-lasting survival uh, from uh, after uh, uh, developing cancer. But interestingly, you know, this is the way that most cancer drugs are being developed now. Um, most companies, and there's huge amounts of program going on, programs going on in all pharmaceutical companies throughout the world, and, and, and they are really focusing on this way of being able to treat cancer. Um, and, and there are benefits as well, uh, because uh, if you can actually show in a small trial that a drug uh, such as this works in that way, then you can actually take a very small trial, which doesn't cost you as much as uh, taking a large trial, and you can get it approved by drug regulatory agencies, the FDA. So this drug, Vemurafenib, that I talked about, was the fastest IFDA approval in history. Uh, and so there are benefits for the pharmaceutical industry in trying to develop this. So people talk about the pharmaceutical industry and talk about blockbusters, uh, but actually, for some of the stratified indications and so on, personalized medicines, they may actually have benefits because they have to do smaller studies and get into market quicker as well. But it, it, it's not only important for cancer, this new way of developing drugs based on genetics. It's, it's already beginning to make inroads into cystic fibrosis. You know cystic fibrosis is the commonest autosomal recessive disease uh, in the Caucasian population. 
occurs in one in 2,500 people. We've known since 1987 what the mutation was on chromosome 7. Uh, but um, it's only in the last couple of years that people have started to, you know, uh, drug therapies come through, which is specific for mutations. So there is a particular mutation uh, in the cystic fibrosis gene, which is called G551D, which is only occurs in 4% of the cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, and these two individuals, working in a company called Vertex, uh, with 200 scientists, were able to identify particular compounds which were able to affect this particular mutation. They screened 600,000 compounds, they did screening on the computer of 2.7 more million compounds, and they came out with a drug called Ivacaftor. Now, Ivacaftor uh, works on this particular mutation and starts making it uh, function normally. Um, and, and, and this has been a fantastic innovation in those patients, kids who have this particular mutation, in that their respiratory function has improved, their life has completely been transformed, they go to school, they have fewer hospital admissions, uh, etc. And that's, that's innovation for you in terms of uh, um, uh, amazing drugs like that. Unfortunately, this comes at a price. It costs the NHS £150,000 per patient per year to treat uh, with this particular drug. So that, that is an issue that maybe we can debate later on. How are we going to be able to afford all these expensive drugs coming through in a personalized manner? However, it's not all, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, expensive drugs. So here's another um, uh, example. And uh, um, when I was a medical student, I loved acronyms. <laughs> I, lo I loved names of syndromes. So I had to put this one on, Brown Violetto Van Lair Syndrome. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds fantastic, doesn't it? It, 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 it is childhood motor neuron disease. Um, kids are born with this, initially they're fine, but uh, at the age of one or two, they start uh, in developing some problems. By, by the time they, sort of, they have speech which is, uh, doesn't develop, uh, they develop swelling problems and so on. Unfortunately, uh, it used to lead to death. And, and when diseases like that come about, and, and rare diseases, often people don't know what they are, and they're diagnostic odysseys. You know, and unfortunately, kids, young kids born with rare diseases, are, go from hospital to hospital, doctor to doctor, having multiple investigations, and nobody knows what's going on. But the ability to sequence a human genome actually is transforming that, um, and, and, and trying to, you know, for us to be able to identify diagnosis and therefore potential treatments. And in this particular case, they were able to sequence parts of the genome and were able to find mutations in a particular gene. Um, and it, it, it's called SLC5283. But basically what this gene does is that it actually transports riboflavin. Now riboflavin is vitamin B2. You could buy that in boots. And, and, and what um, this has transformed the lives of many patients with this. They take high dose riboflavin, vitamin B2, and that's prevented them from progressing in their disease and prevent them from, from dying. And that's personalized medicine actually working. Uh, and, 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 and so it doesn't necessarily mean that what we do with personalized medicine with genomics is going to require very, very expensive drugs. It may also be possible to use uh, drugs or food substances and vitamin, I guess, can be classified as a food substance that you can utilize in that way. So you know that at the moment there is the 100,000 genomes which is being sequenced, uh, uh, a, a project which is going on, which 70,000 people are going to be sequenced, and that data is going to be av available to the NHS, uh, to the doctors in, cl in hospital clinics, to the general practitioner, and so on. Uh, and so it is important that you know it, it's a genomic medicine has already arrived in the NHS, um, and, and it, is, it is going to be utilized in many different ways as we move forward. Um, and, and in fact, it's been suggested that one may go on to have whole human genome sequencing by 2019 for every baby born uh, in this country. Now, that may be uh, an exaggeration. It will occur at some point, but probably not by 2019. Babies, every baby born at the moment does have a heel prick test to be able to test for certain diseases, uh, inborn, uh, inborn errors of metabolism. Uh, but, but, um, uh, by whole human genome sequencing, actually may be cheaper than the heel quick test that we do at the moment, and it may eventually replace uh, uh, the kind of things we do at the moment. So let me just go on to uh, 
the other area of having serious adverse drug reactions. Unfortunately, some patients do develop serious adverse drug reactions uh, when, when they're given drugs. So uh, an example here is something called toxic epidermal necrolysis. This is a patient who was given an anti-epileptic drug um, called carbamazepine, and two weeks later uh, developed uh, blistering of the skin. At the peak of the reaction, 60% of the body surface area was blistered. And the, the sort of, um, mouth was eroded, uh, they couldn't swallow, they couldn't eat. And that's like having third degree burns affecting 60% of the body surface area. Unfortunately, one in three patients who develop this die. Um, and, and so the question is, why? And why, does, why do one in a million patients who are given this drug <coughs> develop this disease? 999,000 people, uh, etc., are perfectly okay when they get that drug. It's only one in a million who will get that uh, particular reaction. So why is that? And this is what we've been trying to do, is to develop uh, reasons, uh, try to identify reasons why certain patients will develop these kind of reactions. Um, and, and, and a typical example of this is seen in this uh, case. It's a drug called Abacavis using HIV. It causes these kind of serious skin reactions about 7% of individuals. Um, and the work which was undertaken by uh, ourselves in Australia and in uh, America was able to show a particular gene, again, the name of the gene doesn't really matter, uh, which was associated with predisposing to this reaction. We asked a simple question. If we were to introduce this, particular uh, test into the NHS, would it save money for the NHS? Uh, and the answer was yes. And we did this study in 2004. Um, I got a lot of contacts, a lot of people contacted me from clinics saying, can we use your data to be able to persuade our NHS managers to introduce the genetic test? And by 2006, every HIV clinic in this country was using this genetic test to be able to prevent this serious reaction. Has it worked? Well, before um, before the test was introduced, the, it, this reaction occurred in about 7% of individuals. Since the test has been utilized since 2006, um, the reaction rate has fallen down to less than 1%. Okay, so, so I haven't seen a case of this, a back of hypersensitive, in the last five years. So this is where genetics is actually working uh, fantastically well uh, in, the, in, the, in the NHS. And there are many other genetic factors which have been identified. Uh, and uh, uh, all, all the time in relation to these serious adverse drug reactions. And I'm showing you just three of them. Uh, in, in fact, since the beginning of this century, 24 different uh, HLA alleles, uh, which are the genes which we're looking at, have been identified with different serious types of adverse drug reactions. Those which may cause bone marrow suppression, those which cause blistering of the skin, those which cause which liver failure, those which affect the muscles and cause uh, your muscles to and uh, necros. Um, and and there's a, we've now got the tools to be able to really try to prevent these particular reactions. And the way we're doing that at the moment is to try to get um, these HLA tests be better available within our NHS hospitals. At the moment, if I wanted to get an HLA test, I would have to get each individual HLA test done. Uh, it would it would cost me, it would cost a, a hospital, um, I work for uh, about £100 to do that test, and it may take me two weeks to get the test through um, uh, for, for my patient. But two weeks is a long time. Um, I don't want to wait two weeks before I give my, the drug I need to give to the patient while waiting for the test results. And so what we've done recently is to work uh, with the company, and we've developed a novel technology which allows us to be able to type for all of those different genes that you saw on the previous slide uh, very quickly with a turnaround time of less than 48 hours. And the cost of that panel is going to be about 20 quid, which is much less than the 100 quid I have to pay for each individual test at the moment. And so while technology is improving, it is also becoming cheaper, and that's the reason for showing you this particular uh, example. The important thing is also that most doctors out there will not really know how to interpret the, that kind of very, very complex test that we are developing. So in order to help them, we've also developed a clinical decision support system. And what that means is that when a test result comes through, the doctor can click on his computer to a link, he'll be taken to a website which will have these kind of data. He can then press on a drug that he wants to look at, that will tell him what that particular 
gene that is important for that particular drug, and it will tell them what to do if a patient is positive for that particular gene. And that kind of clinical decision support system is going to become very important in the future. Nobody will be able to hold three billion data points in their head and remember what each one of them did. So we will need to use information technology in a much better way so that we can actually utilize it to be able to give the best drugs to the, uh, the patient in front of us. It is important to note that a general practitioner has 10 minutes to see a patient in this country. If um, I give him 3 billion data points and say, interpret that, you can see that 10 minutes is going to go out the window, right? He's either going to say, well, I'm going to interpret that and I'll see you in my next session three years from now, or you just throw it away. More likely, he's just going to throw it away. So we need to use computers to be able to help us to interpret that so that we can actually improve the way we treat patients. I'm just going to go to something which is very important, I think, in terms of how we dose, uh, treat patients. The dose. Um, everybody sort of, um, uh, knows that every drug that you take has a dose on it. It will be 10 milligrams, 50 milligrams, etc. And Paracelsus was a polymath. 500 years ago, he said, poison is everything. No thing is without poison. Uh, the dosage is what makes it either a poison or a remedy. And you may have thought that we've learned in 500 years to go be any better than we are at the moment, but unfortunately not. We still don't actually do dosing properly and so on, uh, because we assume that the dose that we give to the patient is equivalent to what actually gets into the bloodstream and into the t area where the disease is, and that's not correct. It varies. So if I gave each of you 10 milligrams of the same tablet, I'll be able to find a 50-fold variation in the amount of drug you have in your bloodstream. And we need to get better at actually um, making sure you're getting the right dose at the right time. And in fact, this is happening with every drug. Here's an example of uh, a drug which is used in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in osteocolitis. It's called infliximab. It's a biologic. It's given by injection. Um, and, and people have been trying to find out why uh, infl infliximab works in some patients and doesn't in others. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best indicator at the moment seems to be the amount of infliximab you have uh, in your bloodstream uh, is a determinant of why it works better. Um, and, and Alan will know that um, there was something called therapeutic drug monitoring, which people have used, and, and he, was, he was the exponent of this. Uh, and therapeutic drug monitoring has gone out of fashion in this country. And in fact, I can promise you that therapy drug monitoring is going to be the major component of precision of personalized medicine uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next decade. And this is what's called reinventing the wheel. <laughs> right? uh, we try to look for very complex solutions, but in fact, some of the um, simplest solutions are, but we've already tried them before and discarded them, and we're coming back to them. And in fact, this is, this is exactly what we do at the moment. You know, if I see a patient with kidney failure, uh, kidney impairment, um, I know from the uh, drug label that I need to be able to release a dose of a certain drug. So here's an example of an antibiotic. Uh, in patients who have uh, a form of kidney failure, I need to be able to reduce the dose so I don't cause any side effects in them. But at the moment, when we have a genetic, uh, effect, a genetic factor in a patient, which causes the same um, magnitude of change as you see with kidney failure, we ignore it. We don't change the doses. And that can lead to problems as well. And so can we actually tackle that and can we actually improve that as well? And that is also happening. And that's starting to happen, for example, with drugs such as warfarin. Now, many, many of you will have heard of warfarin. Some of you may be on warfarin. And warfarin is a drug that's used by 1% of the UK population. Um, it... it uh, uh, the problem with warfarin is that we don't know what dose you'll require. Some people require half a milligram a day, some people require 20 milligrams a day. Um, and uh, we have uh, been trying to identify why it is that there's this variability, in 40-fold variability in dose requirements. The problem is if we, if we get dosing wrong, you can get bleeding, as in, as, in, as in this patient, and we want to avoid that bleeding. So, work which has been undertaken by us, but also by other people, and, and this is a very complex diagram, and basically, this was uh, an, a single study undertaken in 714 patients, and we uh, got a million different data points on each of those 714 patients. So, there's 714 million data points on that one slide. 
Okay, and that's the complexity of, of studies which are being undertaken now. Uh, and, and what this shows, um, and this is the most important part to focus on, it says that as one gets older, uh, you need lower doses of warfarin. Um, and, and you're a very young audience, <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and this is something for you to look forward to. As you get older, your liver gets smaller, so you need lower doses of warfarin. Um, as one gets heavier, you need a higher doses of warfarin, which, which is, which is you know, what you'd expect. But actually, the most important factors determining the dose requirement for warfarin are two genetic factors, uh, which is shown there. Uh, this one called CYP2C9, and this one called DCOC1. And those are the most important factors that determine why uh, one, one uh, requires different doses of warfarin. And in order to determine whether uh, we can actually introduce this into clinical practice, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit technical now, and I'll go through this a bit more slowly, um, we undertook a randomized controlled trial because my physician colleagues are pretty skeptical, conservative, and they need to be. They don't want to introduce innovation without showing that it is, it is working in clinical practice. Um, and so I undertook a randomized controlled trial with, with my collaborators. And what we did was to say, if we compare uh, genetic-based dosing to uh, what we do at the moment in NHS, would it be better? And, and we did this randomized controlled trial in both the UK and in Sweden. And what we were able to show was that genetic-based dosing was 7% better than uh, standard dosing. Now, 7% doesn't seem a lot, but because you're looking at an amplification, uh, a coagulation system, which amplifies its effects, it is actually clinically significant. Um, and, and so we've shown the 7% difference. But, but when um, then I go and show it to commissioners uh, in, in, in England, we have to talk to the clinical commissioning groups. That's how we get funding for hospitals and so on. They say, well, actually, you haven't shown it to be cost-effective. So we then have to do a cost-effectiveness study. That is to show that if we introduce a new innovation to the NHS, it will be affordable to the NHS. And again, we went and showed that it was cost-effective to the NHS, uh, which, 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 is, which is shown on, these, on this particular slide here. And you can see the UK curve uh, shows that by the time uh, the threshold of cost effectiveness is about £20,000 and 90% uh, probability will be cost effective uh, at that kind of threshold. So then, then so once you've done that, people come and say, well, actually, we still don't believe you. Uh, you need to do more studies. Okay, we'll do more studies. So the next thing we did was to actually go and work with the company and develop a new way of genotyping, uh, which was more efficient than we did in the randomized control trial. So we worked with a company called LGC. And basically what this test does is that we take a mouse swab, we put it into this machine here, um, and within 45 minutes we can get results on those two genes I showed to you before. And this can be done by nurses in the clinic. So the next step for us was to share, well actually if we can give the machine to the nurses, they will see the patients and they can dose them based on the genetics they do in the, in the, uh, in the clinic. Will that work? Uh, so we did the randomized control trial, as I said, and so what we then did with the new machine was an implementation study. And the implementation study has just been completed, it's not published. Um, and what this shows is that the implementation study, there's a nurses undertaking, doing a mouth swab, doing the genetic test, doing the dosing themselves based on an algorithm uh, on the web, were able to improve dosing with warfarin by 7% as they were with the randomized control trial. So this actually shows you that it is working as well, and it can work in a real-world setting, uh, such as the NHS with the complexity of the NHS. Now, just going to the last part of, of, uh, uh, of the talk. So, unfortunately, uh, we do have changing demographics, um, and, and our population is getting older, and as one gets older, uh, one's kidney function goes down, uh, one's liver function is not so good, one's respiratory function declines as well. I'm sorry, I don't want to make you depressed. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, you need multiple drugs uh, to be able to control those diseases at a time when all these uh, kidney function, uh, uh, liver function, and so on is going down. So the, the big challenge that's facing personalized medicine, I think, is how are we going to be able to improve the way we treat our elderly so that they can have better lifestyles, better quality of life, stay out of hospital, and have an independent life in the community. 
And, and there are many things one can do, and not just personalized medicine, and, and obviously those, those are all ongoing, but there are ways of being able to look at this in, with personalized medicine as well. Um, and and um, this is one particular study which has been done in the States. Um, and what they did was to say, well, if you had a genetic profile on all your patients, and, and then you were able to dose based on that genetic profile, would that improve uh, various outcomes such as hospital admission, emergency room attendances, uh, etc., and death as well? And they did this uh, in uh, a group of patients who were over 50 years old, who were on multiple <coughs> drugs, had more than five drugs each, and then they did a small trial of 57 patients versus 53 people. And, and they introduced this genetic profiling, first of all, in a group of patients, 57 patients, and they compared them with the 53 who didn't have genetic profiling. And what they were able to show was that in those people who were uh, untested, they all had worse outcomes. So you can see the death rate was higher, uh, the hospitalization there rate was higher, etc., based on genetic profiling. So what was happening from here was that doctors were using the genetics in the patients to be able to modify the doses they were giving, and I again come back to dosing being important, but also the drugs they were giving as well to be able to improve um, the outcomes in these patients. Unfortunately, this is a very small study. It's only 57 uh, versus 53. So what's going on at the moment, um, and, and it's funded by the European Commission, um, is a, a 15 million uh, euro study um, in 10 EU, EU, EU countries with seven different uh, countries recruiting patients uh, to uh, see whether genetic profiling before you see your doctor improves things for you uh, in terms of your outcomes. Uh, and the only site uh, in the UK is in Liverpool, where, where, where so, you know, I'm leading that study. And what we're trying to do is to see whether we can actually improve outcomes in terms of reduced side effects for patients by making genetics available the first time they see the doctor, rather than as a, as a reactive response. So it's preemptive genotyping. And this is really a forerunner to when everybody has a whole genome sequence. And if you have a whole genome sequence, you need to be able to take that into account and not ignore it. Um, and, and this study will tell us whether we can do this in a clinical and cost-effective manner to be able to improve outcomes of our patients. So just the very last part of, um, of the talk is, is really patients and public empowerment. I think one of the major drivers for genomics will actually be uh, the public. Um, and, 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 and some people have already had their um, genome partly, uh, not sequenced, but typed. Um, has anybody had the 23ME test done here? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, it's available for £110. Now, uh, you just send it for, it goes off to the company in the States, and you get the result back, and you get an interpretation. And this is exactly what happened with this particular uh, individual. This was in mid-Wales on a Saturday morning. This patient was having um, uh, an anesthetic procedure. Uh, and this patient handed the 23ME result to the anesthetist and said, I've got a genetic deficiency in this particular enzyme. Please don't give me this an anesthetic. And, 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 and I've had patients coming to me in my clinic handing me those genetic test results. And that's going to become more and more common. And this is really patient empowerment. And, and you know, as general practitioners, doctors, etc., we need to be uh, get ready for this so that we can actually answer our patients. Because I think it's terrible if a doctor says, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and they need to be able to interpret and actually say, well, this is useful or not useful, or if it is useful, how am I going to change your therapy because of that? So that's very important. So patient empowerment is coming through. Some patients are going much further in terms of what they're doing. So, has anybody heard of microbiome? Yeah? Microbiome is the bacteria we carry. There's more bacteria in our body than there are human cells. That's something else we use to report. <laughs> so, some people, you can actually do your microbiome for $90. In, in, you, know, um, you, can, you can stick a uh, swab up your bottom and, and you can do a microbiome of that or you can send some feces to uh, the um, uh, place in the United States and they'll do microbiome for you. If you're really rich, you can do it four times for $400. <laughs> and you can see whether your microbiome changes from week to week. And some people have done that, and some people, particularly in the States, have taken it to extreme. 
they've had an interpretation saying the microbiome is not very healthy, so they've given themselves a fecal transplant. <laughs> this is patient empowerment. <laughs> now, if you don't know how to do fecal transplant, go to YouTube, there's a video there that shows you how to do it. Honestly. And, 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 and this, this uh, uh, person from NIH said that some lay people have taken this idea of fecal transplants and run with it, performing their own fecal transplants at home. Folks are planning to provide them with stool, making stool smoothies. <laughs> I hope they use a different blender than the one they use for the fruit smoothies. <laughs> and then they give themselves stool animals without medical supervision. And then she set, ends up by saying, this is a bit bizarre for a culture where people smear hand sanitizer on the handles of the shopping carts. <laughs> So that's, that's enough of genomics. <laughs> so the, the last thing I want to leave you with is, is a con, uh, um, um, uh, thing about sensors. Who has a Fitbit? Anybody wearing a Fitbit? Yeah, great, some of you have got Fitbits and so on. Um, and, and, and I think sensors are going to be a major part of what we do as well. If you look at um, what a conventional engine does at the moment, you know, some new, new cars that are out there, it's collecting data all the time. <laughs> A flight data recorder will collect two gigabytes of data per flight. Yet, in a newborn baby, we use the same five data points that we used in 1952 at the moment. Which is crazy, you know, that, and with the technology advancing in other areas, why are we still using these five data points in the baby that was, uh, that was devised by Virginia Apka in 1952? And that, that is going to change with the sensors and so on. And this is already happening, and patients again in power is very important. Patients can now buy sensors which can actually record their own ECG on an iPhone. Okay? Um, and, and this has actually been, has got medical um, uh, uh, consequences as well. Because many patients will go, uh, have been to see me and the cardiologist, and they say, I've got palpitations. So we do a, a recording for 24 hours, we don't find any, uh, any arrhythmias. We do a recording for five days, we don't find any arrhythmias. But in fact, what's happening with this is that you can uh, give the sensor, and, and many cardiologists now do give a sensor um, to the patient. They can put it on the back of the iPhone. When they get palpitations, they just put both fingers on that sensor, and that gives you an ECG recording like that. And from that ECG recording, you can tell whether you've got an arrhythmia or not. And this is really patients helping themselves with their own treatment and so on. And those kind of sensors are going to become more and more common. And, 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 and the reason for that is because of the digital revolution. Uh, uh, and it says the number of smartphones uh, is going to increase to about 6.1 billion by 2020. Um, and, and apparently, um, that uh, uh, at the moment, we carry about 1.8 devices per person. I'm not sure what the point is. <laughs> and, and, and by 2020, we're going to carry 6.6 .6 devices. <laughs> but we'll be overloaded with iPhones, <laughs> But, but if that is true, they, they, we, are, we, have a digital, we are in the middle of a digital revolution, which is going to be very important. So let me finish. Um, for some areas, I think, for example, in cancer, um, NHS is already delivering personalized medicines. However, access to medicines and diagnostics required to practice personalized medicine can be patchy. It's important that we actually make sure that it's available to everybody so we don't exacerbate health inequalities. Genome sequencing will become more common and everybody will have genome sequence at birth eventually. We need to learn how to be able to interpret that and use it effectively. I think an important aspect of any kind of delivery of personalized medicine is going to be the edu uh, education and training of our workforce to become, make them more skilled in delivering that. Uh, also important is uh, uh, the education of the public. Um, in terms of what they can expect on personalized medicine, what are the benefits, but also what are the limitations. Personalized medicine is not a panacea. Uh, it's a refinement of what we do in medicine. And everything we do in medicine, apart from occasional revolutions, is a refinement, is, is, is an evolution of, of the way we practice medicine. And that's important to understand that. Uh, and, and, and so what I've done to do is to cover uh, some aspects of personalized medicine, only small aspects I've covered. There are an enormous number of things going on, and if you are interested, there's lots of different sort of, you know, sources uh, that you can read on the internet, but please be aware of fake news. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm, just, I'm from Liverpool, as you know, and I, I, I'm going to leave you with a quote from John Lennon. It'll all be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. <laughs> <laughs>